Hi there, thank you for joining us on the Audit Bunsen One Question series. My name is Jules McKean and I run the global media practice for Audit Bunsen Executive Search out of London. I am delighted to be joined today by Rory Sutherland. Hi Rory, thanks for joining us. Hello, great pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Rory, as I'm sure many of you already know, is the Vice Chairman of Ogilvy, where he's worked since 1988. And I'm going to use his words when I say this attractively vague job title, um, has allowed him to perform behavioural science practice within the agency dedicated to uncovering the hidden business and social possibilities which emerge when you apply creative minds and latest thinking in psychology and behavioural science. He's the author of three books, The Wiki Man, The Best-Selling Alchemy, which I have right here, um, and the, the, which is The Surprising Power of Ideas uh, That Don't Make Sense, and that's published in the UK and the US in May 2019. And he's also co-written with his former colleague, Pete Dyson, the newly released Transport for Humans on the Behavioural Science of Transport. And Rory's book, I mean, Alchemy is an incredible book, and I'm sure we'll touch on some of the ideas inside it. And when we're looking at behavioural science, what we've been through for the last couple of years, Rory, what we're about to go through the next however many years, who better to ask the question for this season, which is how well is our industry adapting to the shifting shifting economic situation, we might put socio-economic situation in there as we head into 2023. Okay. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think we're being fully visionary enough about what unintentionally the pandemic might have gifted us. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, a, there's, there's always a gap in conversation and discussion, particularly discussion at a business level, around what I call the missing middle. Okay. There's an enormous amount of, of quantification of and analysis of the past because the past has already generated a lot of data. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's also a kind of fashionable conversation which is always going on about the more distant future, which would be something like the metaverse or Web3 or blockchain or whatever. Mm -hmm. Things which are five years out, six years out, we're very happy to talk about because the risk of being proven wrong <laughs> is, it, it is perhaps slightly less. Quantification bias uh, causes us, I think, disproportionately to look at the past as though it were uh, a guide to the future. Now, when you've had a major event, that, that's unsafe in anything except the very short term at the best of times, okay? Extrapolation from past trends is highly dangerous at the best of times. When you've had a major simultaneous world disruptive event, it's even more dangerous still. Yes. And I always make the point about big data that all big data comes from the same place, the past. Yes. That we think that its bigness somehow makes it impartial and representative and valuable. But we forget the fundamental bias, which is it tells us nothing about what hasn't yet happened. Yes. And so one area of discussion, which I think, I suppose there's been quite a bit of noise about it, but actually the fact that the world had a crash course in video conferencing, just as the world had a crash course in how to use QR codes, okay, yes. um, was an unintended obviously, but nonetheless interesting and probably beneficial side effect of the pandemic. Yeah. And I don't think we're talking about it quite enough. No. Because I think there is the potential, or rather what we're doing is we're sort of talking about it through the lens of necessity, which is, oh my goodness, some of my staff are reluctant to come back into the office. Rather than asking a slightly more open-ended question, which is, what are the consequences if now, I'm going to frame this very strangely, okay? Most people in knowledge work never negotiated with their employers on the basis of autonomy because they assumed it was a non-negotiable, okay? The second you took an office job, the second you took a job in the knowledge economy, it was assumed that you worked in an office probably in the middle of some pretty expensive real estate and you travelled in five days a week and you spent, at the very least, core working hours in that place with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And it was simply a given. And of course, no one person could negotiate at autonomy on their own because they looked like the lazy guy. Mm -hmm. of, no, not the majority. A very significant minority of higher paid older people would have preferred a four day working week with a commensurate reduction in salary. But who was going to put the bell on the cat? OK, who was going to take the first move? Because the first person becomes the part timer and their career is effectively over. And there's the stigma of kind of lack of sacrificial commitment. 
Mm. Now, suddenly, because of this simultaneous event, people have discovered that they value autonomy perhaps more than they imagined. Yeah. And particularly some people. I don't mm -hmm. think that's everybody. But the opportunity actually to engage with a workforce where it isn't just a question of money and power. Mm. There's, a, there's a third variable going on and it may indeed become mm. a major status marker, not what, not so much what your job title is or indeed what you earn and what you own, but a significant status marker might well be the level of work autonomy you have. And that might be autonomy of team, task, time, topography, in other words, being able yeah. to work from different places. Okay. But actually, um, one of the core psychological needs, there's a wonderful model called the SCARF model, and it's mm. things that humans care about that don't get measured because we don't have mathematical units for them. And SCARF stands for, it's from David Rock, a neuroscientist, uh, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, or reciprocality, you might want to call it, and fairness. Yeah. And it's very interesting because I think those five things are very, very important to HR understanding the extent to which people are not only rewarded financially, they're also rewarded in the shape of scarf treatment. And they tend to get overlooked. And in the case of knowledge work, autonomy got completely ignored. Now, it would be vanishingly unlikely if something like the pandemic didn't throw up some beneficial yes. Um, side effects. Yeah, a very small one is I hope Britain doesn't go back to restricting cafes from putting tables out on the pavements because we kind of discovered during the pandemic that even in surprisingly cold weather, eating and drinking out of doors, in fact, that was historically, that was why we went to France. We, yeah. thought we, we thought we liked France for the culture, the wine and the food, but it turns out that the main good reason to go to France was that you can sit outside <laughs> while consuming those things. And actually, Britain has pretty good wine, pretty good cheese, pretty good, interesting culture. Maybe what was missing was just the tables and chairs on the pavement. And I know yeah. that sounds really trivial, OK? Uh, it sounds, it's, it's not entirely trivial because you can't want what you've never experienced. No. And there's habits that formed quite quickly over that yep. period of time. And, and a lot of that is habitual, isn't it? If you, if you just do it a few times and suddenly it becomes more natural and then you don't look back. I mean, it, it's very interesting in the sense that we accepted, you know, a five day commute. Now, the reason I say this has huge importance is that everybody's currently looking at it through a narrow lens, which is what do I want my staff to do? What do I want my direct reports to do? What should be our established norm in our organization? But there's a much bigger question, actually, which is um, I would argue that the, the Henry Ford question, which is what do you want your consumers to do? Now, I would argue that a major explosion in flexible work, okay, one or two of my staff, I expect, will probably start a side gig. Bad for me, good for the economy as a whole, okay? Because let's face it, if, you know, if one in 10 um, flexible workers, uh, there's a famous case of someone working for a very, very large American corporation who was also running a massive online sneaker store yes. at the same time. You heard yeah. about this? yeah. Good luck to him, yeah. my view. Because... I have to check it wasn't my teenager, actually. Just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the, uh, actually, get your teenagers onto illegal drugs. It's a much less expensive <laughs> habit than, than the sneaker <laughs> habit. Yeah. Um, the, um, the other thing is that if consumers have a greater degree of autonomy of time and place, mm. potentially it should inject a lot of discretionary money back into the productive economy. Mm. And... and Henry Ford famously, I mean, it's it's sort of half true, the story, it's not 100% true, but the argument is that he created the two day weekend for his workers, not only for the benefit of the workers themselves, but in the hope that it would spread, because if the American working man had a two day weekend, it was worth buying a car. It, oh, wow, that's so interesting. I didn't know that. I occasionally go and speak at um, travel and leisure conferences in the United States, marketing conferences for the, uh, you know, the travel and entertainment industry. And I always start with a joke, which is you're all wasting your time. OK, before you do any other marketing, everybody in the room should pool their marketing budgets and spend four years lobbying for Americans to have four weeks paid vacation. Yeah, because yeah. everything else you do while Americans only have two weeks paid vacation and are frightened to take both weeks. Yeah. Any chances of significantly growing the American tourist economy beyond cruise ships and student travel 
Yeah. You're all scrapping for the same small yeah, You're, you're all scrapping. And I always notice that you go on holiday in the United States. You go to the Grand Canyon in August. And, OK, you have to go to the overflow car park. But it's not that crowded. And I said, look, if the Grand Canyon were in Spain, you wouldn't be able to get near the bloody thing in August. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And the fact that now Henry Henry Fordism, which is actually should people like Unilever actually deliberately evangelize because a small loss of your own staff productivity, which is by no means necessary, by the way, it's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think I think it's perfectly possible to have a huge increase in productivity through mm -hmm. a mixture of co-location and mm -hmm. uh, flexibility. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, it's a pay rise for your staff, because if they can go and live in Brighton rather than help, Brighton's not a very good example, but if they can go and live in Margate rather than London, their yeah. disposable income will go up. It's like yeah. a tax free pay rise. It's also hugely significant to the wider economy, because I think most people don't retire because they want to stop work. They retire because they want to stop commuting. And the biggest problem the UK economy faces is an extraordinary percentage of people in their 50s and, si and early 60s who are economically inactive. Yes. yes. I, was I was talking to people who operate call centres at you know enormous scale. Now, there's a job which actually can be done very, very flexibly. Yeah. You know, it's, it's equivalent to being an Uber driver where you don't even have to move. Yeah. Okay? Um, there are an awful lot of jobs which if you remove the requirement for um, uh, living in, working in a megalopolis and traveling in five days a week to the same place, there are an awful lot of jobs which become doable um, by people in their late 50s, early 60s. And, and part helps of the global economy, doesn't it? It's it's helps global economies in their, in their villages that have been I mean, the one unfailing way to to you know to grow an economy is to actually introduce women to the workplace. Okay. Well, child, now, child care costs might be something that might want to be considered around that. Then. Well, well, no. I mean, actually, there were there were hidden costs to that, which is that what started as an option ultimately, because of property prices, became a necessity, yeah. which is not quite the same thing. Yes. But I mean, there are there are. Uh, there's a wonderful paper by Noah Smith called um, uh, in, on the prospects for a Zoom boom. And his argument is that the biggest contribution the internet might make to service sector productivity um, is, uh, and, and his idea is distributed service sector productivity, is that video calling might do for the service sector what electrification and the steam engine did for manufacturing and the production line. Yeah, yeah. But we have the potential if we reshape how we work and we, and we solve the coordination problems, we have, I think, the possibility to have a huge increase in productivity and also, by the way, a huge um, move towards the levelling up agenda. Yes. I would argue nobody in Britain aged over 32, unless they're offered like a job at Goldman Sachs, nobody aged 32 with a kid in a relationship can really move to London. It doesn't yeah. make sense. OK. So what we're doing is we're increasingly overfishing this weird pool of graduates who moved down to London with their mates and did a flat share in Clapham. Okay, yeah. right. and actually, which, there's, which there's is a, a very non-diverse way of looking at it. Totally. So we, 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 we talk about ethnic discrimination, gender discrimination, but geographical discrimination yeah. is alive and well. Okay, yeah. I mean Brummies, right? I mean, you know, it's a city of two million people. Um, one of the most peculiar aspects of lockdown was that because of video calling, I had not only more conversations with people in Botswana, I had more conversations with people in Birmingham. Yes, yes, I, absolutely. I, I, I hate to break it to you, but there are really, really interesting, intelligent, probably <laughs> undervalued people uh, in the West Midlands. Yes. You know, much as it'll come as a shock to people in you know, the home counties, uh, you know, actually, you know, in many ways, advertising talent in those places is always very good, because if you can survive there, you have to be pretty good to begin with. Yes. And the broadcasters have done Channel 4 and, I, and the BBC have done a fantastic job in the yeah. region nations, pushing and almost like forcing the agenda into Salford, into Exeter, into Glasgow, particularly in the, in the, with the Scottish and, and Leeds. I also, I also have a weird theory, which is that, that this is, to be honest, an outsider theory, but that certain areas of the you may get a kind of Brooklyn effect where certain places become cooler than London. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the reason is that actually to sustain cool, you need low, relatively low property prices. Yes. I notice the phenomenon because I go to the Kent coast a lot. 
and you keep getting these restaurants opening and you go where did the chef work beforehand it was some michelin star place in london and you kind of go it's a bit weird that he's opening in margate isn't it and then you realize no no because no, you can own the restaurant i'm a georgist by the way not many people are google it but fundamentally i think henry george's insight into the economy which is that whenever you have productive activity that depends on location for its performance the gains end up going to the the, the landowner not to the person doing the work Interesting. Yeah. So when, when people said you must come back into London to bail out Pret-a-Manger, my argument was you're not bailing out Pret-a-Manger, you're bailing out the Duke of Westminster. Now that's fine if you want to bail out the Duke of Westminster, but what might make more sense is for Pret-a-Manger to go and open in Margate. Okay. Why? Okay. So, I mean, I, it's, it's ironic because my father was a landlord. And so for me to be basically highly questioning and kind of rent-seeking, <laughs> Uh, aspects of the property industry is a bit weird but then Adam Smith worked as a customers inspector so what the hell but, um... <laughs> how does it how Rory how does given that we have changed so much in terms of our working patterns our locations even family units have been so completely disrupted over the last couple of years some for better part some for the worse uh, when we go into the next recession when I think about when you're talking about you we use data it's hardly past is there a tendency, do you think, for us to look at this next, this recession that we're currently officially already in uh, and apply the rules from previous recession, which are completely, in some cases, potentially null and void because we've had this weird two years of a lockdown in between this recession and previous recession for 2008, which have already seismically changed how people feel about getting together, how people feel about TV content at home and engaging in gaming. Everything's changed in those two years. But, you know, are there things that we should just make sure we don't make lazy assumptions about going into this recession? Uh, well, the first one is, um, I, I, I still think one of the possible Brexit dividends is that the government could become much more intelligent about taxing consumption. And as you remember, you know, one of the arguments for leaving the EU, although on its own, it wasn't perhaps the strongest one, was you can't even get rid of VAT on women's sanitary products because what you charge VAT on within the single market was completely constrained. I think the possibility exists to um, engage in, partly to use technology, to engage in much more intelligent taxation mm. so that essentials are taxed less and things like energy should be untaxed up to a certain point and mm -hmm. then your use of energy beyond a certain threshold should attract a, an ever increasing rate of, of taxation okay mm -hmm. i think the possibilities for doing things like that which are basically redistributive i mean the window tax <laughs> i mean okay the, the thing about the window tax was that it was broadly speaking redistributive you, you know, yeah. 18th yeah, century, just like the, the poll tax tried to be later, I suppose. which is why you still see 18th century buildings in the UK, which have the windows bricked in, which is I see well, you're taking yours out now, though, yours is back. No, 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 I, we, 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 I don't, I actually see question whether this, I, I don't think, I don't, uh, I, interesting question whether this house was actually partly designed with the window tax in mind because there's not <laughs> that many windows but the window tax was clever because it was redistributive but it was also sort of avoidable yes now, the problem with an income tax is it's redistributive, but it's unavoidable. Now, you know, so it doesn't create any beneficial behavior other than people actually arguably working a bit less. Yeah. Okay. You or couldn't... leaving the workforce or not or, paying. Or, or, or in the case of people in their 50s, it seems to be people leaving the workforce. Or doctors G giving G up. G doing Do doctors it. quitting too early, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, by the way, I'll be absolutely honest with this. There is a counter argument that actually higher rates of tax make people work harder because some people basically set the level of expenditure they're comfortable with and work up until the point they can actually uh, match that lifestyle. But I think to an extent, in terms of broader life decisions like when to retire, I think that, you know, higher rates of income tax are probably, uh, you know, something of a dis you know, disincentive to keep working. And so... You know, reintroducing what you might call the modern version of the window tax, where if people choose to, you know, live fairly modestly, uh, you know, they pay less tax and the tax is to some extent disproportionately levied on those areas of behaviour which have 
negative social consequences. So I mean, an interesting, an interesting thought would be, arguably, when you go and buy a pint of beer in a pub, you should pay 0% VAT, whereas when you drink beer at home, you should pay 20% or 30% VAT. And the reason for that difference is that in supporting the pub, yeah. you are, albeit unintentionally, performing a pro-social action. Interesting. Whereas in drinking on your own, you know, I mean, positional goods generally would come out badly from that taxation. You know, jewellery, luxury cars, etc., would come out relatively badly, whereas pro-social goods would come out disproportionately well. That's interesting. I've never heard that before. That's a really interesting thought. Do I mean, you... we do it with a sense we did it with tobacco and alcohol. There's no reason why you can't do it with other forms of uh, it's Pigovian taxation, I think, is the technical term. You could do it with lots of other things as well. And so, with with every, all of these changes that we've seen, do you think our industry, define as you wish, it is well set up to weather the oncoming storm? Do you think it's it's making the right preparations? You know, I've heard. Um, I, I personally, I'm going to be really rude here. I think the advertising industry has completely failed specifically I mean the creative agencies has completely failed to understand that the market for creativity is much much wider than just the Marcom's budget of yeah. large corporations and the, the tragedy is that when we moved from being paid by commission um, we took a worse form of remuneration I think payment by the hour is always a terrible way yeah. to pay okay um, because effectively it always becomes a cost conversation, not a value conversation, once Absolutely. you're paid by the hour. And it, it, it's the kiss of death for an industry. Um, you know, I mean, you know, imagine how much money, say, Procter & Gamble would make if everybody knew how much it cost to make a tube of toothpaste. OK, that's not the point. It's the value you pay for, not yep. the cost. OK, now, the, having said that, when we went to payment by the hour, it did free us up to go and seek other forms of yeah. uh, other other budgets. OK, and I think the creative talents that are present, not exclusively, but disproportionately present in kind of advertising, creative agencies, digital agencies, has been overly directed at where the old account people knew how to make money, which is chasing the, the comms budget, and media budget yeah. of a, you know, a large established company. When we could have been doubly useful and actually grown, had we only learned how to target other forms of, of, uh, uh, of value creation. Yeah, yeah, that's very... And, and I, think, I think the muscle memory of the ad industry has kept it kind of trapped in this, let's, talk, let, let's go and sell what we do to the people who go to CAM, basically. OK, now I think, you know, and as a result, m consulting firms, which aren't very creative and tend to tend to basically make businesses more and more alike by effectively, you know, selling a cookie cutter solution to a whole series of entities in the same business category. They've actually kind of grown uh, to an extraordinary degree. Yeah, they productize what they and do. They, so they, they productize what they've done. Now, yeah. we're still constrained. One of the interesting things is you never get a budget to take an advertising or marketing person's mindset and apply it not to a brand problem, but to a category problem. Mm. Mm. A category problem like sustainability or the electrification of the car or how do we persuade people who shop online to use lockers rather than getting delivery to the home. OK, and those are category problems and there aren't any category marketing budgets. They, yeah, they go into the management consultants. So they go, the category budgets yeah. go into management consultants. And the, and the only thing we get are brand budgets. But not, everything's, not everything is solvable at the brand level. Yeah. Yeah. You know, solar panels, for example. You know, how, how would you sell solar panels in a way that people actually felt confident buying them? That's, you know, that's not a problem for a specific solar panel manufacturer. It's a problem for the, you know, the whole category. How should government pay subsidies for things in a way that actually achieves the most emotional bang for the buck? Yeah. Again, that's a psychological creative problem. And the last people you want addressing that problem are economists, because they'll just define the problem in economic terms and surprise, surprise, solve it in economic terms. When it's really a psychological and behavioral problem, not an economic one. And, and a systemic one. There's so many parts of supply, supply chain that can fall down or support the proposition at any one time that you have to have, uh, uh, you know, be more upstream. That's really interesting.
if if you so so Rory, given what I would love to talk to you all day, I'm very conscious of your time. Tell By me. By the way, I mean my opportunity for the advertising industry is the charged for Zoom. I'm giving this away. I don't know why I'm giving it. Oh, away. just about to ask you what was your piece of advice? If you're um, doing the it. charged for <laughs> Zoom webinar where you use your convening yeah. power to get together people who share a problem. They might pay five hundred pounds a head. Okay. Now, you're now using network effects to make yes. Mac McKinsey money by charging effectively, you know, Odeon prices, <laughs> okay? You use the magic of broadcast and the webinar and the Zoom revolution to actually solve once, sell many times, rather than solve once, sell once. No one else in the ad industry seems to have spotted this, and it drives me nuts, because, you know, my argument would be, the economic value we could create by convening groups of people who share a particular interest yes. and then by injecting uh, creativity into the mix and by in a sense in a weird way it's like reversing the pitch process the pitch yes. process is skewed against us because it's five agencies competing for one budget okay and this will be one agency competing for 20 budgets which is a much yes. better way around to actually make the thing work it seems absolutely self-evident to me that a part of the large agency groups should reform to fundamentally reshape how they deliver to turn it from being a handshake business to a broadcasting business. Yes, it's really interesting because we we talked about the way that management consultants do that. They 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 have, I'm going to guess, twenty very common business problems yes. across the categories that they can productize and have you know a choose your own adventure for want of a better toolkit doing it solving presumably actually in what you're talking about and convening those people together you could quite straightforwardly get to you know here's the session we're going to do on this business problem here's the one in this business problem and actually it will apply to a high multiple clients i remember when i was in new business myself um the AR thing, one of the most successful lines that they had maybe 20 years ago, it was now when DCC people set, set up, and they said, we're only for people who are launching a brand or relaunching a brand. Now, by definition, if you're pitching, you are all already either relaunching or launching. Of course, launching. of course. It makes you feel like you're self-select. That's me. I'm self-select. That, that, that was the, the whole idea behind disruption, was it? Absolutely. My old yeah. It was ingenious, wasn't it? Because yeah. it effectively said, our target audience is the only people with any money. Yeah. Um, but by positioning yourself as a specialist, you right. effectively elevated the conversation. Great. Freakishly clever, these Frenchies, aren't they? Yeah. No, no, you're absolutely right. And now this, everybody owns disruption, it seems, as well. It's really interesting. Um, Rory, you absolute legend. Thank you very much for spending the time with us today. I um, really hope that we can see how this behavioural economics goes in action over the next year and tries to help us adapt to human behavior and not just what the data of the past has told us so fingers crossed and thank you very much i'm glad that we've got you at our side here's hoping thank you very much indeed